Hello everybody. Good evening and welcome to the launch for Peter Kahn's book Little Kings. I'm absolutely delighted tonight to be here with poets Peter Kahn, Malika Booker, Nick Markoa, Roger Robinson and Jacob Samler Rose. I'm Jane Kamein from Nine Arches Press. I'm editor and publisher for Peter Kahn and for Little Kings and I'm absolutely delighted to be joining you all this evening and to be broadcasting live to hopefully audiences, an audience of hundreds tonight which is really exciting and um, first of all to say a huge congratulations to Peter on publication of this beautiful book. We are so very proud to be publishing this at Nine Arches and absolutely delighted to be here tonight with all of our brilliant readers as well. We've got a lovely event lined up with some wonderful guest readings um, with a Q&A as well. So please make yourselves at home, make yourselves comfortable and come in, come and enjoy and share poetry with us this evening. The way this will work is that I'm going to hand over to Peter in just a moment. Peter's going to introduce each one of his guest readers, and then we're going to proceed to hear a reading from Peter himself, some Q and A's from his guest readers. There'll also hopefully be time for a couple of Q and A's from, reader, from our audience members. So um, we will be keeping an eye out later on on the um, chat. So if you do have a question, please post it in live chat. We may only have time for a couple of them, but we'll try to combine them. And then we will finish with a poem from Peter. So thank you very much for joining us all this evening here live on YouTube to celebrate the welcome uh, and welcome the new book by Peter Kahn, Little Kings. I'll now hand over to Peter himself. Hey, good afternoon from Chicago. Thank you all for being here. I think there's over 300 of you out there, though I can't see you. A um, couple of things before I introduce one of my good friends. Uh, I'll get to introduce all four of them. First off, happy birthday to Bismarck. Um, I hope you're having a good day. And I have some thank yous I want to uh, do here at the beginning. So first of all, the family and friends have been so supportive of me over the years, especially my mom and dad, who are my biggest fans. Um, obviously, Jane and Angela and Nine Arches Press for bringing this book out into the world. Thank you so much for your expertise and hard work and wisdom. Um, to Taylor Varnado, a former student of mine, who did the cover art for Little Kings. To Jacob, Malika, Nick, and Roger for being here with me. Um, to Malika, Nick, Roger, Raymond, Antrobus, and Inua Elms for writing really beautiful endorsements. To Malika's Kitchen, London, and Chicago, especially Roger, Malika, and Jacob for setting me on this path. Uh, other writing mentors, Afa Michael Weaver, Mark Doty, Terrence Hayes, and my mentors for my uh, MFA program at Fairfield, Baron Wormser, Bill Patrick, and Eugenia Kim, uh, Goldsmiths and Holy Family in the Spoken Word Education Training Program with Kat Brogan and Pete Bearder, and Indigo Williams, Dean Atta, Keith Jarrett, and Ray Antropus for believing in me. And then finally, Oak Park and River Forest High School to students, staff, Spoken Word Club members, alumni, teachers, administrators, and board members for always being so supportive of me. So thanks again for you all being here. It's gonna be great to hear from my, my good friends coming up. I'm very excited to hear them. They would have been there in London. My parents would have been there in London, but here we are in the virtual world together. So first I have the ple pleasure and privilege of introducing Mr. Jacob Sam LaRose. I first met Jacob in about September of 2001 and he soon thereafter became one of the leaders of Malika's Kitchen. We teamed up with Pharaoh Malik to create the London Teenage Poetry Slam and later collaborated on the Spoken Word Education Training Program. And he's worked with my students at Oak Park several times over the years in Chicago. I've learned a ton from Jacob about writing and teaching. He meticulously approaches both and operates with great humanity, humility, and integrity. He's molded more young writers in the UK than anyone I can think of. Um, a favorite memory with Jacob was the community building day in May or June of 2001 for the London Teenage Poetry Slam. Um, and we were at Oval House. And at that point, the slam was just sort of a notion. And we had kids from eight different schools from three different boroughs having an incredible time together. And I remember looking at Jacob and, and we 
we're witnessing all of this and we, we realize this is going to be an impactful reality. So that was, that was a beautiful moment. Um, now for a quick bio, uh, Jacob is one of the youngest pe uh, poets featured in Poetry by Heart. His poems are taught in schools throughout the UK. He's read and taught around the world, including Botswana and Malaysia. His beautiful poetry collection, Breaking Silence, was shortlisted for the Forward Prize for Best First Collection. I hope you purchase it. Please give a warm virtual welcome to Jacob Sam LaRose. It's a lovely thing to be here to celebrate Peter Kahn and the launch of Peter Kahn's collection. Um, Peter, you, you have once again managed to pull the band back together, so to speak. Um, yeah, it's, it's a joy to be here, bearing everything that you've done uh, for all of us and for many of the people watching here this evening. So I'm just going to read um, three short poems uh, before passing the mic back to Peter. Um, this poem is entitled For the Young Men Popping Wheelies on Southwark Street in Late Afternoon Traffic. The title runs into the poem, so I'll read it again. For the young men popping wheelies on Southwark Street in late afternoon traffic, one day you will die. But not today. And perhaps you have already tasted it. Whatever endings taste of, a mouthful of road and iron, the weight of something implacable you couldn't lift yourself from under. Not today. Today you are brazen, quick as a blade, wheels up and threading into an HGV's path and out again, uproarious, alive, and testing whatever binds the rest of us to good sense whatever weights another driver's fist with righteousness and ties us to our quaint and tidy appetites and has us hook our eyes to pull you down and safe and anchored to the meek and common ground. Today, everything lifts from you, like the ringing of a bell in clean air, like smoke. Um, the next poem I'm going to read is an extract from a longer piece. Uh, the piece is entitled uh, An Ode to Hip Hop circa 1993. I was an old school hip hop head. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a long and sprawling piece that's still being edited down. But this is one part of it. I try you on for size. And beneath your skin, I find you composed of two-tone over baggy jeans, a teenage musk, a flurry of thrown fists, a bootlegged pair of Air Jordans that never quite fit, a pocket full of unused pseudonyms, the poetics of place names, the casual intimacy of trimming the man I called my father's hair, the map of the contours of his face, my mother's gold teeth and the last night she slapped me, the way the tears crawled back into their ducts, soundtracked by the gun talk of every hard rapper ever. And I learned to fear the fact that I could be something to be afraid of. A speaker box made from the wood of an abandoned wardrobe. And that moment, Sister Eunice leapt from the window of her third floor walk up with a show-stopping elegance, chased by the ravenous flames of suspect provenance as if she could float with no crowd to catch her as she fell. Thank you, Peter. I'm going to read one last poem. Um, and this poem I read uh, with Peter in mind, I believe uh, the last time I saw him, this was the last poem that I shared with him or that I read in his presence that he said he had some kind of liking for. Um, so um, yeah. Peter, this is a poem for you. Synesthesia. In Oregon, there's a blind man who sees with his tongue. A part of his skull was surprised by a bullet that wasn't meant for him. His wife screamed for him in Portuguese before she remembered which country that particular night belonged to. 
under duress, the tongue sometimes returns to the heart to another answer. The blind man has learned to taste light. Myopia is an aberration of the eyeball's curvature to the extent that the light falls short, like trying to discern the words of a neighbor's conversation through the walls. The words slot into place like lenses in an optician's testing frame. Some nights, a poem arrives like an unexpected bullet to the brain. Everything tastes different after. Peter Kahn, thank you. This is your evening. Congratulations. Thank you, Jacob, Jacob Sam LaRose. Uh, the ringing of a bell and clean air. Damn. Appreciate you being here. And I hope to get you back in Chicago when this all clears. So thank you. All right, next up, one of my good friends. We have the co-founder of Malika's Kitchen. I first met Malika Booker in August of 2001 at Centerprise Bookstore store in Hackney. I was asking her about teaching poetry in schools and she said, well, you know, are you a poet? And I said, nah, I mean, I write with my students. She said, you're a poet. And then she took out a little notebook and she wrote down her phone number and address and said, be here at eight o'clock on Friday night. I just started a writing collective. And I showed up and the course of my life was changed forever. And I found a, a second family through Malika's Kitchen. Um, Malika's kind but firm manner of giving feedback has greatly informed how I work with my students and she's inspired countless writers around the world. Um, she's been instrumental in the democratization of poetry in the UK. Um, by the way, this is from around when I met her. A favorite Malika moment, and there are many, but I'll focus in on last summer when I brought over Kara Jackson and Natalie Richardson and Patricia Frazier as part of this Youth Poet Laureate Exchange. And Malika took a train down from Leeds, met with us for a couple of hours, and you know, all three of them were big fans of Pepper Seed, so this is a huge deal. And then she took a train back to Leeds. But that's what Malika is about. She's all about community and self-sacrifice. Um, so that was just a really beautiful thing to see my former students um, engage with Malika. Um, Malika was the first British poet to become a Cave Canem Fellow. She's published in Penguin Modern Poets with Borsan Chere and one of her poetry idols, Sharon Olds. Uh, Malika has been twice shortlisted for the Forward Prize for Best Poem, including this year. And her collection, Pepper Seed, is a must read. Please welcome the co-founder of Malika's Kitchen, the unbelievable Malika Booker. <laughs> unmute, unmute Malika. All right. Thank you so much, Peter Khan. Um, it's such a pleasure. It's, I'm so happy to be here this evening to celebrate with you, Little Kings. What a phenomenal and fantastic collection. Um, and yeah, it's just wonderful to be here with all the kitchen members. Um, I'm going to read a long poem that I've written um, recently. Um, I've been working on a project where I have been. Um, looking at the Caribbean, what happens if you place the Caribbean region um, within the King James Bible. And um, this poem is a dedication to my friend Denise, um, who was buried on Monday, um, this Monday just gone. And um, yeah, this is a, an elegy for her in the best way that I could write it. A time to cast away stories and a time to gather stones. Let me start again. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace or a time to refrain from embracing. An alternative history of stones, take one. Let us address the stones. What are you, stone? if not a pebble that can be carried by hand. 
therefore, is the hand your servant? A new stone, too, have your stories to tell. If a hand throws you stone, who is in the wrong? The hand? The poet piles up stones to build a cathedral around a young black woman so she will not burn. Stone, though she hears you only scorch, crumble or crack on the flames, the poet builds this protection. But it is too late in this season of struggling lungs and hammering fists behind quarantine doors. Mothers warn daughters, sometimes men will come like sheep but are really goats. He came like a lamb and turned bull, turned beast, pummeling with hoofs, breathing fire. Stones, this is meant to be a poem about you, sir, but it is an unruly poem, a hard-headed poem, a wayward poem. Now the poet's heart is a stone. Yesterday, a picture of a young black woman friend bounced into the poet's inbox. He killed her, underlined, underneath. An alternative history of stones, take two. Let us address the stones, and you stone, too, have stories to tell. Back home in the woman's hometown village, Young men gather stones in lush green bush to create a circle to rest their pots over hot coals cooking oil down. Yesterday, news flew across the net like a soiled dove with a broken wing, fragile bruises bloomed. How long had he been seasoning the woman up to cook in our home like a house was an oven? Oh. Let us address the stones, as stones too have stories to tell. Sir, you tell me the poet stone does not burn, it may crack or even be crushed into powder, but your answer is too late, stone. You speak of David toppling Goliath with his slingshot. In the woman's village, boys went into the bush armed with slingshots to pelt birds, break their wings. Is this where the man learned to break his dove's wings? Remember, poet, you say, this is a poem about stones. Meanwhile, across Facebook, the woman's friends are stones rumbling, heavy. One post states, I spoke to her only last night. Death did not hint it was a stone's throw to the crawling fire. In this poem, honey thickens in the woman's vein instead of water, boiling epidermis shrinks then splits open and oil flows from the woman's body like boiling tears oh give me more oil in my lamp keep it burning her friends sing a chorus across facebook hymns to erase thoughts of oil in that oven burning burning till daybreak sir this is a poem about stones yes and you stones have your stories to look at the woman's village a nun sits on a big stone. Look again at the woman's village. A nun sits on a big stone by the seashore under the fire of sunset, praying for the woman trapped between a rock and a hard marriage. Sir, stone, is prayer a servant of the mouth like stones are servants of the palm? Where were prayers at daybreak? Oh, let us address the stones, as stones have their own story to tell. The poet attempts to resurrect. The poem attempts to resuscitate. Oh, let us address the stones. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for, for this. Thank you, Ms. Booker, and my condolences. Um, so the next book after Pepper Seed sounds like somehow it might even be better than Pepper Seed, which is something of a miracle. So can't wait to see it. Thank you. All right, next I get to introduce my buddy, Nick Makoha. When I first met him, he was known as Urban Spirit. It was September of 2001 at the Bug Bar in Brixton, September 12th to be exact. It was Malika's Kitchen Reading. 
was one of my first public readings, so I was quite nervous. And Nick came up to me afterwards, it was very kind and complimentary, and made me feel really good about the evening. So thank you, Nick. Um, we soon became very good friends through Malika's Kitchen and the London Teenage Poetry Slam. And Nick has come over to Chicago more than any of my other British friends, probably 10 times over the years, maybe even more. In my opinion, Nick is the best youth poetry slam coach in the world. He's essentially uh, Phil Jackson with an edge, getting the most out of his poets through extremely high expectations. And that's how he operates in general. He inspires me to be a better writer and a better teacher. A favorite Nick memory was in November of 2008 when Jacob, our buddy Mike Vance and Nick came over uh, as part of the London Teenage Poetry Slam and we were working in schools. And on that Tuesday in November, when Obama was elected, we were gonna be doing a workshop the next morning. So I was gonna watch on TV and uh, Nick and Mike were staying with me and they said, no, this is history, we're going to Grant Park. So we took the train down to Grant Park and we were part of that historic moment. So the next morning where Nick was staying, I was shaving in the bathroom right next to his room and he was Skyping with his partner, Joe, and his daughter, Olivia, who was maybe three at the time. And I overheard him say, Olivia, there's, there's a black president in America. And Olivia said, daddy, does this mean I can be prime minister someday? And man, that moment, that, was, that summarized the hope that was in the air. And if you know Olivia, if she wants to be, she will be prime minister. So there is still some hope out there. Um, like Malika, Nick is a Cave Canem fellow. He's won a variety of writing awards, including the Brunel International African Poetry Prize. Shout out to Kwame Dawes and the winner of the Toy Derricotte and Cornelius E.D. Chapbook Prize that Kaveh Kahnem puts together. Uh, Nick's first and only collection for the moment, Kingdom of Gravity, was shortlisted for the Forward Prize for first best collection. Please provide a warm virtual welcome to Nick Makoha, formerly Urban Spirit. Yeah, thank you, Pete. Um, yeah, um, likewise, uh, you will one of our close friends and uh, we brought the Avengers back together, it seems. The world needs saving, obviously. Um, yeah, I'm gonna read um, three poems. I'm gonna read said title poem, um, Kingdom of Gravity, and then I'm gonna share two new poems um, from what could possibly be the new collection. We don't know. But um, I just wanna say thank you that you guys are alive. We take for granted our, our lives in in life before COVID. Sorry for those who have passed, but um, I'm grateful that we have language and we have poetry to share who and what we are in the world. So um, I'll share with you Kingdom of Gravity, um, the title poem from my collection. We are not Alexander who conquered worlds, giving them new tongues. But we share the story of a ship resting on an African river, unbuckling at its shore, Wakened by a cold, hard rain, waiting, um, awakened by a cold, hard rain, staring at the face of the Nile as it reminds you that you are a hawk, silent to the voice of a midnight universe. What makes a man name a city after himself? Asking the bricks to be bones, asking the wind to breathe like the lungs of a night, asking the night to come close to speak to you as a tribe asking the tribe to sleep, asking sleep to loosen language. Come close to me. Can you not see that I'm in search of fire, the unshapen song of light? In my mouth is a name, hovering like smoke, spoken to me by an oracle. Like others, I was in search of a forest, a place to call home. What can I tell you about the kingdom, about having the world at your feet? When you have seen all of Earth's boundaries, you will crave for mirrors, searching for them in streams. And when the river looks back at you, how can you be sure that nothing is lost? All right, so I'm gonna give you some new ones. Um, 
Um, only a few people have seen these babies, but uh, let's see how it goes. So the first one is called When the World Broke Open. When the world broke open, October ended, a first darkness, looting along the border, trees on fire, bars filled with shadows. This is how we will burn, said the trees. Block after block of storefront skylines turned on their side. We consoled ourselves with short breaths. These were the rewards of a night snapped shut. Somewhere, a chopper took off, steered by unknown hands into a sky loaded with stars. The silhouette of a mountain watched. The river cut the city in two. The country running away from us. What would remain important years down the line was not the distant waters or our city drawn to scale or how a sea covered the shoreline like a burial sheet, but the body of a dead friend bent across a gate, now just a trace of some absent thing. Okay, I bring the joy among the group. And my final poem is uh, called Codex One. Um, In this story of falling, a cigarette is brought back to life. The body inhales, the sky is full of night. Soon it will be dry season and the hills will rust. But tonight, the night keeps moving the way that birds do towards migration. What does living do for any of us? The winds have found some clouds to play with as trees rehearse the gesture of surrender. Do birds think that cities are our version of the natural world? Have you seen a city on fire? Flames throwing themselves at buildings the way that the sea throws itself at the rocks? The furnace is the city's costume. This world is a desperate element. I suffer the shame of asking what happens in the voids, what shape, the soil takes when roots vanish, the visible making itself known by the invisible. Rain falls on the trees as the dark brick of our old lives is the pitch of this moment. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. And the furnace is the city's costume. So like with pepper seeds, somehow I think we're going to get an even better book than Kingdom of Gravity. Is that possible, Nick? That's how I'm, that's how I'm like a kitchen rolls. There we go. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot, Nick. All right, our final guest reader, Mr. Roger Robinson. I first met in Malika's flat in August of 2001 when he came barreling in and led the second ever Malika's kitchen that I was the first one I was a part of. Um, here's a photo from a couple years after that from the London Teenage Poetry Slam with Kevin Koval. Um, Roger is probably the most influential person on my writing career, and I'm, I know I'm not the only one that feels that way. Along with Patricia Smith and Terrence Hayes, Roger has been my go-to poet to use with my students over the years as well. A uh, favorite memory with Roger was in the summer of 2003, uh, there was a term break before the London Teenage Poetry Slam. And prior to that, Jacob and I and Farrow were working furiously along with the coaches to get ready for that. And then a buddy of mine, Tim Jacoby, came over from Columbus and got hit by a motorcycle before I even got a chance to see him. And, that, and when I did see him, he was lying in, in critical care in London, Royal London Hospital. So basically, I was, we were having meetings at the hospital to get ready for the slam. Unfortunately, Tim recovered enough to go back to the States and Roger and Nicola had been kind enough to invite me down to Trinidad. So I went down to Trinidad and all the stress just dissipated. And Roger's mom took me in like another son for that, those 10 days. Um, and I remember one morning that I came out early and there was a stack of A4 paper that said uh, suitcase on the cover and it was a manuscript for Roger's first book. And 
I'm not a huge fan of reading poetry. I prefer fiction. And I read that sucker co cover to cover. And it made me believe in the power of poetry in that moment more than perhaps any time, not including students. So uh, I love Roger's other books. I have them all here. But Suitcase holds a special place in my heart. As many of you know, Roger is the most recent winner of both the T.S. Eliot Prize and the Royal Society of Literature Andachi Prize for his most recent collection, Portable Paradise, a must-own book. Give it up for co-founder of Malaika's Poetry Kitchen, T.S. Eliot Prize winner, the man, the myth, Roger Robinson. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, Peter is someone who I respect and love so much. And he he's very humble. He doesn't talk about the many communities he supports and how he is the heartbeat for many tributary flows of blood and poetry worldwide, including me. There was a time where most people know that I didn't believe that I could adopt poetry as a profession, um, going off into different elements of music, going off into different types of things. Peter Kahn is one of the few people when at the fulcrum of me saying I should just stop this, nobody looks, reads my work, nobody gives me any money, nobody books me for anything. Peter Kahn said, I think your poetry is amazing. And then he told me all the time, just, I don't want you to be the best poet I know that nobody ever heard about, please. And every time I would tell him about some newfangled album with electronica or country, he'd be like, uh, you're writing any new poems? That's all I want to hear, you know, more or less that. So without Peter, I would not be the poet who I am. Uh, as much as he says he's learned from me, I've learned doubly from him. And he's someone who's full of heart and love. This first poem I'm going to read is a poem called Grace, or somebody who valued my son. And I think I'm reading it because Peter is someone who values not just poets, but all young people and all humans. He's someone who always wants to help. And I'm su super happy that he has his book out. Super happy is on Nine Arches Press. I urge you to go and buy it. This poem is called Grace. This was about, um, my son had a very convoluted birth story and a West Indian nurse who was often chronically undervalued in their work, um, took particular interest in my son and I believe let him live, live. Her name is Grace. And this is a love letter to the NHS. For all the Americans, that's like the free medical care we get, you know. Grace. That year, we danced to the green bleeps on screens. My son had come early, just the one kilogram of him, all big head, bulging eyes, and blue veins. On the ward, I met Grace, a Jamaican senior nurse who sang pop songs on her shift like they were hymns. Your son, feisty, he just pulling off all the breeding masks. People spoke of her in half tones down these carbolic holes. Even the doctors gave way to her when it came to putting a line into my son's nylon thread of a vein. She'd warned junior doctors with trembling hands, I only let you try twice. On her night shift, she'd pull my son's incubator into her room, no matter the tangled confusion of wires and machine. When the consultant told my wife and I on morning rounds that he's not sure my son will live, and if he lives, he might never leave the hospital. She pulled us quickly aside and said, him have no right to tell you that just raw so. Another consultant tells the nurses to stop feeding a baby who will soon die. And she commands her loyal nurses to feed him. Feed him. No baby must dead with a hungry belly. And she sit in the dark, rocking that well-fed baby held to her bosom, humming 
the melody of happy by Pharrell. And I think if by some chance I'm not here and my son's life should flicker, then Greece, she should be the one. I just want to let everybody know my son is completely fine. He is, he is rocking. He is doing Taekwondo on me every day. So there's nothing wrong with my son. He's six and a half now. Uh -huh. So I just then you know that. Um, in, in the spirit of new poems and Malaika's Kitchen, and I've been writing new poems with uh, Malaika and Nick, trying to get to two poems a week. I'm going to try and read a new poem in, um, in honor of... Um, the things that are happening now, and also in honor of the newness of Pete's book, you know. Um, let me see if I can find it. Don't get worried, Pete. I'm all right. I got it. I got it sorted. <laughs> this poem is called Hung. It's brand new. Nobody's ever heard it. Um, some people, some, some poetry, Malika's Poetry Kitchen crew have read it, but nobody's ever heard it. This is... Um, the first time. After the excited crowds of children, fathers and mothers dispersed, the hung black man opened one eye cautiously. There was no one in sight, so he got his tied hands free, grabbed the rope and pulled his body weight up with one hand and loosened the rope around his neck with the other. The hung black man felt hungry. He had a taste for roasted corn with its blackened char-grilled pearls coated in salted butter. He rubbed his badly bruised neck. He sits at the base of the tree and thinks about the emotional damage to the cheering crowds who do not even understand their pain. He thinks how that pain will run through every generation of the child who watched the black man choke and swing like a pendulum while his mother wore her Sunday best and clapped. He couldn't think of the correct ritual to break the curse pronounced on the white children. Then a white man dressed in a black suit was walking directly towards him. He got up to defend himself and the man walked through him as if he didn't see him as if he wasn't there. Then the trees whispered, it's time. And small eddies in the dust whispered, it's time. And the clouds whispered, it's time. And so it was. Thank you. Big congratulations, Pete. And it's such an honor reading with the old Malaika's Poetry Kitchen crew. I've enjoyed every minute of it. Thank you, Roger Robinson. Uh, man, that new poem, that, that is amazing and powerful. So I'm Thank looking you. forward to seeing your new collection. Would that be collection number six? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> on a lighter note, you reminded me uh, when you weren't sure if you were finding the poem. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> that I was at a reading of Rogers when he was reading his short stories. And he was right in the middle of a, a short story. And he goes to flip the page and he's missing like two pages of the short story. <laughs> the, end, the, end of, the, the end of the story. <laughs> yeah, you just ended up abruptly <laughs> ending it. And we went out afterwards to, to celebrate your sort of half-assed attempt at that short story. <laughs> um, but that's the other, what's the name of your short story collection? Adventures in 3D. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really cool as well. Yeah. Thanks a lot. And thanks for your kind words, Roger. Oh, this man, it's real. Yeah. All right, thanks. All right, Jane. Hello, um, thank you very much. Um, that, those readings were just astounding. Thank you so much to Jacob Samler Rose, to Malika Booker, to Nick Markoa, to Roger Robinson for those really very beautiful readings and to have an exclusive as well. So many new, wonderful new poems to hear those. It was really very moving um, as well. Thank you so much for sharing those. And I think that's um, very much heart, heart, the heart of Malika's Poetry Kitchen feels that it's the heart of both Peter's book and at the heart of tonight's event. So I'm 
um, I want to offer some thanks really to Malika's Poetry Kitchen, to Malika and to Roger for founding um, we have published at Nine Arches so many of your poets over the years and are absolutely in awe of everything that MPK has achieved and continues to achieve. So thank you so much. And it's a delight to publish another poet from Malika's Poetry Kitchen's roster in Peter Kahn's Little Kings. So we are extra delighted to have you as part of tonight's event for, for, for so many reasons, but certainly for those ones too. Thank you again to our guest readers. I think this is um, just such a wonderful way to celebrate um, a new book coming into the world is to invite all of the people who have been a part of that story in various ways. And it's also been wonderful listening to Peter talking about all of those um, occasions and um, all of those um, stories as well. Um, thank you. Um, I want to say a thanks to Apples and Snakes as well, because tonight we were meant to be in the Tate in London um, doing this event with all of our guests and all of our guest readers. And obviously for so many reasons um, with um, COVID-19 and with everything that's happened, so many events have been canceled. And um, Peter would have also been at various festivals in the UK. So um, it feels, um, it, it, a little bit extra special really tonight to celebrate in this way um, all together and to have that sense of community very much at the heart of tonight's reading also. So thank you very much and to just say to anybody who's watching if you've enjoyed those readings please do buy the books we've popped in the introduction underneath the information for this video links to all of the publishers. People Tree who publish Malaika, Nick and Roger are an astoundingly fantastic publisher and I have published so many great collections over the years so do support them and Jacob Samler Rose and I share a publisher in the form of Blood Axe Books as well. Blood Axe again a superb publisher so do visit those publisher pages and buy the books and also Peter's book is available for, direct from us at Nine Arches Press as well. So it's now my turn to introduce Peter. And it's a real privilege to do this and to be welcoming his debut collection into, into our lives, onto our shelves, into our hearts. It's also a real, privilege, uh, sorry, a real privilege and a pleasure to get to know Peter over the last few years. As many of you know, um, his reputation as a poetry teacher and encourager and educator precedes him. He's been instrumental in holding up the talent of so many um, great poets into the light and supporting and nurturing those new voices and giving his time and dedication to the wider poetry community. And tonight is his turn to shine in the spotlight. I'm absolutely thrilled to be launching Little Kings with you all. It's a book of poems which have such great clarity and an innate humane instinct. These are poems that explore family and diaspora stories and seek to find in American life, in teaching, in surviving, those interwoven narratives of escape, refuge and learning. These are poems um, that also, I think, have a great power to draw us into their hearts, a great humane power. And I love as well Peter's just great ability to address his reader to pull them into the heart of the action to always draw them center within what's happening within his poems and they are often so beautifully focused so it's been a real pleasure to have worked on these poems and I wanted to say a little bit about that story as well and a little bit about how Nine Arches Press came to publish Little Kings. This is of course with a debt of thanks to Nick Markoa. Um, at Ledbury three years ago in July, in weather very similar to the weather we're having in the UK at the moment, beautiful balmy weather that I always associate with that particular poetry festival which takes place every year in Herefordshire in England um, around about the first week of July. Um, I was talking to Nick and, and as we sort of parted, Nick said something like, if I ever know of a really good submission, if I ever know of a, a, somebody I think I should send to you, is it okay if I, you know, suggest they send you a manuscript? I said, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, it was a year later at the same festival that I was actually sat in the sun reading Peter's manuscript. And it was one of those afternoons and I remember it really clearly because it was almost too hot to be sitting outside and 
I read the manuscript. I consumed it from beginning to end and I wasn't able to put it down. They're always the kind of manuscripts you dream about coming into your inbox. Um, it was really extraordinary and I read it hungrily and I knew I had to accept it. Um, I'm delighted as well to say that last year, Peter and I, um, during that time, we, we sort of spent time talking by video and talking by email and planning this book and um, editing and working together via lots of video calls. And then finally met last June in London. Um, and we had a, a really lovely afternoon before that laureate event at the British Library talking about the poems and about the book. Um, every book is a journey. And I think that it's really, a wonderful thing tonight, Peter, that your book is here. It has been um, a journey for us of um, three years and a journey for you of a, quite a little bit longer. But I'm absolutely delighted that you entrusted it to Nine Arches and I'm so thrilled to be launching it tonight with so much love and support for you from your fellow guest poets, from your audience. I have sneaked a little peek at some of the comments and all of the um, celebration and praise and love for you and for your poems. Um, so though tonight we'd have been at Tate in London and then possibly also at Ledbury later on, um, and though we are instead online, I'm grateful and thankful and full of celebration, Peter, for you and for your, for your tremendous book. Here's to Little Kings and let's enjoy a reading from Peter Kahn. Thank you, Peter. Thanks so much, Jean. That was really kind and it's been wonderful working with you. I've learned a lot. Um, and thanks again to my buddies, uh, Jacob, Malika, Nick, and, and Roger for reading alongside with me like we would have in person. Um, this has been almost 20 years in the making. I was talking to Roger about that. Um, and it's gonna go on the shelf right next to the Golden Shovel Anthology, New Poems Honoring Gwendolyn Brooks. Shout out to Mike Beaker and University of Arkansas Press and Terrence Hayes and my co-editors, Robbie Shankar and Patricia Smith. I believe Patricia Smith's going to be celebrating her 65th birthday coming up. Um, so yeah, these are two, two things I put a lot of time in and a lot of love in, and they've loved me back in many ways. So thank you. So I'm going to read six poems right now from Little Kings, and then one at the end after the Q&A. So the first poem is the first poem in the book. It's called Grandpa's Fancy Watch, inspired the cover art in part for, by uh, Taylor Varnado. And it's one of Malika's favorites, so I felt I should read it. Uh, Grandpa's Fancy Watch. A long, long time ago, even before the iPhone, Grandpa Hans had a fancy wristwatch. It had no battery and nothing to wind it up. As long as he moved, so did the watch's hands. It was some slick trick. Grandpa's forearms looked like holiday hands. They rippled from the meat he chopped year after year at the butcher shop. How did he slip on that watch? Grandpa would take it off and tell me to watch the hands slow to a stop. Don't shoot, they'd say. He'd tell me to close my eyes and count to 20. When I opened them, I'd look at the hands waving. We're alive, we're alive. The watch died when Grandpa Hans did its hands clasped in prayer. So that's the, the opening poem of the book. Uh, the title poem is what I'm gonna read next. It's called Little Kings. Um, and I got help from Malika's Kitchen Chicago in revising this. Uh, so Avery R. Young, Agochi, Tara Betts, Krista Franklin, Kevin Koval, they were all helpful with this. Uh, names have been changed. And this is the title poem, Little Kings. Eighth grade, no parents home at Rob Kenton's house. Six of us watch young Frankenstein in the basement buzzed on Little King's cream ale. Eight packs of eight ounces. Green bottles cuddled like teddy bears we, we hide in the closet instead of tossing. Commercial for Laverne and Shirley, we toast the TV chuckle and chug, stand like chorus girls, kick legs, slur, five, six, seven, eight, Shamil, Shamazel, Hoppinstead Incorporated. No parents, teachers, bullying big brothers. The movie comes back on, Igor's eyes bulging, remind me of my own, 
ear blurred. Parents do in an hour, we take a last gulp of Little Kings. Each of us vow to finish off an eight pack. I stop at five, cautious then as now, listening to the retching. Six had Jeff burping, cursing his big sister. She bought the beer. Dr. Frankenstein calls Frau Blucher and the horses neigh and whinny, kicking their rear legs as we clutch our stomachs. Seven beers made Rob empty his belly like a torn bag of groceries. Eight got Carl wide-eyed, muttering, snot-filled gibberish as if the real Frankenstein monster, bolts and all, was stomping his way. Did he see Rob's pale, pieced together face, waxy from the mortician three years later after riding shotgun to a drunken Cuervo girl, gold driver? The doorbell rings repeatedly, drawing us from our subterranean castle, reminding us we were all fuzzy mustache and puff of bony chest we hoped made us look old enough to buy our own beer. Three years later in the funeral parlor, it's clear our crowns were from Burger King. Our kingdom, youth's puffed up buzz. Now one of the newest entries, this is just written a couple of years ago, I believe. Um, it's called 2771. So basically my grandpa Hans is one of the reoccurring characters who's a protagonist, along with my grandma Liz, for instance. But I have a, a nemesis, an arch nemesis, who appears in several poems. And that was our across the street neighbor, Mrs. Lanzia. And she lived at 2774 Lakenhurst Drive. And we lived at 2771 where my parents still reside. So this is entitled 2771. You are a number and a home, a place that made me with a neighbor who deflated me like the basketball that stammered into her yard to die alone. The electric fence that wasn't there keeping me with you, 2771. Mrs. Lanzia was a ghost that haunted long before she died, and somehow she's there every each time I visit you, bullying from across the way, undaunted by the zinnias mom planted to pretty the view. Shout out to my mom. Um, this next poem, I got uh, help in revising this from Roger and Baron Wormser. Uh, and it was published earlier this month in Oxford Brooks University's Poetry Center. It's called On Top of the Monte Carlo and the, the title bleeds into the poem. On top of the Monte Carlo in North Miami Beach, almost 30 floors up, there's an Orthodox Jew smoking a cigarette and gasping at the ocean. I do that too sometimes, wondering if the waves think they can catch up to one another. I am jogging and dodging feral cats who weren't here a few years ago, but dart around like waterless minnows across this path. And I wonder if this smoking Jew is from Paris. There are lots of French speakers down here and their words swim into my ears soaked with Yiddish, I don't understand, but understand. And I'm a reformed Jew, if that, and I don't smoke, but I am running and thinking of grandpa who smoked a pipe and how he was orthodox for a while in New York, but he never talked to me about that, nor about much of anything from his past. He spoke German until he fled the Gestapo on some rickety ship to Brazil, where he learned Portuguese and made it to the States, and learned English and how to be an American citizen. He did tell me about that. I speak un peu de Francais, the pretty language grandpa told me to study instead of the ugly claw of German but can't imagine having to flee my home, my country, my language for simply being what I was born to be. And I am agnostic and believe that God shakes his head like grandpa used to while he watches religion puff and puff and blow too much down. And there was Bulli's mayor telling Omar to sell everything for something or get nothing at all. Either way, she had to leave. And Oma took everything she could fit in a suitcase rather than take anything Nazi. And she ended up in New York and her mom ended up in Theresienstadt or Auschwitz, we'll never know. 
And as I double back past the Monte Carlo, I look up to see if the French Jew is still there, but I can't even see remnants of smoke testifying he even existed. Was he there at all? Was he? And I think of how there are no more cons living in Germany. Huff, some mirrors and smoke trick. And I wonder what my grandfather would or wouldn't say in between puffs of his pipe, of what it's like to be a Jew in Paris or one standing alone on the roof of a hotel in Miami Beach as clouds slow march over waves that billow and billow took towards some type of safe shore. So now I'm gonna read two short poems about teaching. Um, so I, I'm, I'm waiting for the day that we can safely go back and be with our students. I really miss them. I hope that day is sooner than, than later. Um, so I started out my teaching career at a place, a social service agency called Jobs for Youth Chicago, where they did GED classes for those who dropped out of high school uh, or had been kicked out and then job readiness classes as well. Um, and I started there as a VISTA volunteer doing very boring work not involved with any of the young people who are students there. So this is called On First Knowing You're a Teacher. Robert's not coming in, my boss tells me. I'm sitting, sweating in a windowless office, a stack of resumes eyeballing me, stinking up the desk. I'm first screener and sleepy in this stuffy box. Would you be able to lead a workshop on resume writing? I'm 22 and my own resume got me the most boring gig at Jobs for Youth Chicago. Some of the youth I'd be teaching are nearly my age, but there are windows and people in that classroom. So I nearly yell, yes. 30 students look at me and 45 minutes later look to me and I'm hooked and I'm floating and anchored at the same time for the first time. And I'm whole and broken open and I'm spinning and stunned still. And for my last poem at the moment, so the closing poem, kind of the flip side of teaching. Um, I know there are a lot of teachers in the audience and you can attest how uh, teaching consumes your waking thoughts during the school year and sometimes even in the summer and sometimes even invades your dreams. So this is what a teacher's dream looks like. Students won't stop talking, and I know what I'm saying is important, but now they have their headphones in, and they're talking even louder. And there's defiance in the not listening. That's an open-handed slap. I don't recognize any of them, but they're mine. I know they're mine, and if they're mine, and they won't listen, what am I but a handprint fading from red to nothing? Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter, for that beautiful reading, for that extraordinary reading. Um, it was so wonderful to hear those poems come to life. And I've been looking over the last few weeks to watch some of your videos, but how wonderful to hear the set from you tonight. Thank you very much for reading for us. Um, Peter is going to come back and read one more poem to close this evening, but we're now going to move into the second part of of the event, which is a QA. and a um, All of the guest poets this evening have questions to ask, so um, I'm going to hand over to them in order to ask their questions and for Peter then to answer. Our first poet is Jacob Samler Rose. Hello again. Um, wave. Uh, firstly, just to say, it's a testament to the human being that you are, Peter, that we can have this virtual event and yet still experience so much love without actually being in the same physical space to still summon up and muster that sense of joy and, and love that just exudes from what it is that I've seen thus far. It's an amazing thing. And again, I doff my imaginary cap to you, sir. Um, so the question that I had for you was, um, and it really, it goes out with, um, with a nod to anyone who's listening today or watching any of this reading and, um, and kind of ticking off the striking lines or 
the stretch bridge metaphors um, as the poems are being read through. Um, what have you learned along the way to producing this collection that will impact on what you do as a mentor, educator, facilitator, facilitator editor, moving forward beyond this moment? Is there anything that surprised you or was it more about underlining thinking that you had already established? Thanks, Jacob. Um, you know, I think the process was rather validating at putting this together and, you know, getting feedback from various people that was pretty consistent. Um, what I took away as an educator that I think has been helpful over, over the years of getting feedback on this is there are some poems that uh, got some acclaim more than other poems, but they didn't quite fit in this collection, right? And there are other poems that I thought were good poems, but they didn't quite fit in the collection, but there was a way of steering them towards the larger body of the collection. So when I work with, with students, I, I always think about when I'm giving feedback and they're not fond of that feedback, to try to frame it that, you know, this, this is a good poem, it's just not a good poem for this particular theme. So you can put that away and come back to it, but for right now we're focusing on this particular theme, right? Or right now this part of the poem is working, but if you can steer in this direction, it's gonna work even better for these purposes. So I think those are a couple of takeaways that I got out of this process. Um, so thanks, Jacob, for that question. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Our next question um, will be from Malika Booker. Can't hear you, Malika. Like you're still on mute. Malika, I always get sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Um, I was saying, Peter, that you have this talent for like coming over and bringing all of us back together, um, all of the kitchen back together. And this is uh, your your best feat, the best way you did it, um, celebrating you. So my question is that you've been writing and teaching for a number of years before you decided to do an MFA. Um, I want to know why you decided to do an MFA as someone who's been working all, you know, all the time I've known you on your poetry. Um, and how did the MFA impact on your writing and particularly on this collection? Thanks, Malika. Um, so there was a, a big gap in my life after Malika's Kitchen Chicago disbanded, right? So I had two years in London and a couple of years in Chicago. And after that disbanded, I started doing summer residencies, like where I'd go away for a week. So that's where I got to study with Alpha Michael Weaver twice, Terrence Hayes twice, and Mark Doty. And I got a lot out of those. But what I was realizing, it was rather disjointed, right? And it would just be during the summer. So I heard about low residency MFAs that I could do while I was teaching. And I heard about Baron Wormser from Patricia Smith, who studied with him. And if Baron Wormser was good enough for Patricia Smith, he was good enough for me. Uh, and he was at this Fairfield program. And I got to work with him and Bill Patrick and Eugenia Kim on this collection. And having that consistent two and a half years of them getting to know my writing and getting to know poems in this collection was really invaluable for me. So while you helped me with it and Roger and Nick and Jacob helped me in the formation of the manuscript, that MFA was kind of a, a through thread for those two and a half years leading into Jane then coming in with that real keen eye. So thank you, Malika. Thank you very much, Malika, as well. Our next um, question will come from Nick Markoa. Yeah, just to say uh, thank you, Jane, for accepting my endorsement when I, t I told you about Pete's work. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't have been here. But um, one thing um, that is a really important to a writer is a good editor writer relationship. Um, and um, I mean, I tell you, Jacob's a good editor, but like it's really good to have that relationship where you feel they extend what you can do. And I just thought it would be a good fit. So, um, yeah, my question for you, Peter, um, the title poems are really important, but why did you call it Little Kings? What is the, what is the, uh, the story behind that? So, as I said, this has been kind of 20 years in the making. I, first, I think the first version of Little Kings was probably 14, 15 years ago. And really you and Roger and Alika and Nick 
help or, and Jacob helped me with that. And I was, you know, finalist for a couple of first book prizes for that. Um, and that was called Little Kings because of that poem. And I, I like the ring of it and sort of the different connotations of it. And then when I brought a version of it to the MFA program, I was playing around. I, I changed it to the a poem it was titled Dropped. So it was called Dropped. And then uh, Pretending Not to Notice and the Surprise of It, all poems from the book. And Barron was very adamant that Little Kings was the title, that it, it just encompassed a lot and was both open-ended, but also narrowing in a, in a good way, and focusing in a good way. So we went with it, Jane was happy with it, and here it is, Little Kings on this beautiful cover by Taylor Varnado. So thank you, Nick. Thank you very much, Nick. Our final question will come from Roger Robinson. And just a reminder as well, if you'd like to ask any questions, um, we do have live chat open at the moment on the YouTube channel. So if you want to just post your questions there, we'll make sure that they get asked um, as many as we can fit in anyway this evening before um, the final poem from Peter Kahn. Um, Roger Robinson, your question for Peter. Yes, Pete. Um, how do you see yourself in the kind of Chicago storytelling tradition of someone like, say, Studs Terkel? So Chicago's, you know, I got to see Studs Terkel. Um, he was incredible. Uh, and, you know, we've had Gwendolyn Brooks, who I got to meet, uh, Richard Wright, Carl Sandberg, Lorraine Hansberry, Alex Kotlowitz, Sandra Cisneros, along with Studs Terkel. And now this new generation of storytellers like Eve Ewing, Jose Olivares, Jamila Woods, Adam Levin, Christian Robinson, Dan Sullivan, Nate Marshall. Uh, it has a rich history and I'm not in their league, but what I hope to have accomplished here is to perhaps representing my family's history in ways that it hasn't been represented. And one set of experiences of, of a social, a former social worker and a teacher. I don't think those stories get told very much in the, the world of poetry. So I think that's where I fit in the tradition. It, it's, I'm inspired by those people that I've named. I don't, I'm not in that league, I really am not. But uh, I hope I've taken a little bit of them with me and hopefully am, am yeah, sharing that for my parents and my sister and my nephew and my cousins and the like. I would say you are in the league. You know, I, I, I would not say, I think you're from, there's, there's a fine lineage. And I think what you're focusing on as you know, the kind of um, how centered the story is on your lineage of your family and stuff like that, that in itself is inherently political and inherently big in terms of storytelling because it's those are the stories that are missing. And somebody like Stubb Stickle and some of the other people who you mentioned, they really are telling very unique stories. They're not telling generalized stories. So I'm just gonna disagree with that. You know what I'm saying? I'm not large. I'm not, I'm not as large as I think you are. Thanks, Roger. Yeah. Appreciate you. Thank you so much to all of our guests who've been asking questions. Um, that was absolutely wonderful and uh, just a really good way of exploring the collection as well. Um, this video will stay up, so if you want to revisit any of those questions or come back to any of the readings, please do. Um, we've had some lovely questions coming in on the Q&A as well. So I'm just going to pop over and um, pick um, a couple of questions. We'll try and fit in um, as, as many as we reasonably can um, before the end of the event at 9 p.m. Um, the first question I've got is from Stephen Waddell. Peter, you said there were poems that you had that didn't make it into this collection. If you were to produce another collection, what might it be about? Hey, Steve Waddell. Um, I have no idea. Frankly, you know, I'm more excited about an anthology that we're working on of, of students and former students. I think this, this is my book. Um, as my four friends know, I'm a teacher first and a poet second. So I think it was important to me as a member of Malika's Kitchen and just as a role model to put this book out. But I don't know if there will be another book of my own poetry. Um, so I look forward to helping you with yours, Steve, but I don't know if I'm going to do any more. Of course, there'll be another book. Yes, there'll be another book. Don't you dare. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm sure um, there has to be another book. Sorry, there will be another book. The Blanca's Poetry Kitchen Collective has spoken. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter. And thank you, Steve, for your question. Um, our next question comes from um, Maisie Lawrence. And I'm just trying to, um, it's, Maisie asks, it's so lovely to hear Yiddish in a poem. Could you talk about writing into your Jewish heritage and using Yiddish? So, as I said in the poem, like I, I uh, speak Yiddish. Um, so that was, I think my Jewish heritage is very important to my writing. Um, as I wrote, I'm not a religious person, but the fact that my family, I lost family in the Holocaust and my grandparents had to flee Germany uh, in the worst of conditions um, for being Jews makes me solidly a Jew, right? And I guess I want to write from a contemporary perspective there while, uh, recognizing that that dark history that some people deny even happened. So I think it's important in putting that out there. Um, and Macy, congratulations on the Malika's Kitchen Anthology that you're putting together. I'm really excited to be a part of that and to see it. Thank you very much, Maisie, and thank you, Peter, for the um, answer. And I'm just going to pick um, another question as well from the list. We've got a few more coming in. Thank you ever so much to everybody who's participating in this. It's been um, wonderful to see so much reaction to the poems as they've been read and your reaction now as well with the questions. Um, this next question is from Miriam Nash. She says, before the incredible teachers with you here on Zoom, who were the teachers who supported you? So for me, uh, I would say Mr. Sebastian and Mr. Cole, my 10th grade uh, American studies teachers and Mr. Allen, who was an English teacher, they supported me. I, you know, not, I wrote, you know, nothing much in terms of poetry until I was an adult. Um, so then it would be, the people that I've mentioned, so Terrence Hayes and Alpha Michael Weaver and Mark Doty and the four of the people that you see here and other members of Malika's Poetry Kitchen that I've mentioned and haven't mentioned, uh, they were my teachers in terms of that. Uh, and then overall, I'd say um, also my fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Gardner, my third grade teacher, Mrs. Sanders. Those are people that, that helped me believe in myself um, and, and built my vocabulary that, that was useful as a poet. So thank you for that question. Thank you very much, Miriam, for the question too, and Peter for your answer. And our next question, we'll probably take a couple more. I think we've just got time for a couple more questions before um, the end. Um, this comes from Charlotte Ansel, who says, hey, Peter, thanks for the lovely event. What is your go-to best piece of advice for poets? All right, hey, Charlotte, Malika's Kitchen member from back in the day. Um, my best piece of advice for poets and I, I do workshops on this, is essentially if you're struggling, writing, read, you know, that's obvious advice. Tara Betts talks about that. All these people talk about it, but read with an eye towards writing prompts. And my assistants, Adam and David Gilmer and Christian Robinson, that's how we essentially come up with prompts is we'll read poems. So from, uh, we use Grace, the poem Grace by Roger Robinson with our spoken word club. And we had club members look through it and say, well, what could you write about from your experience that relates to this? You know, is there an unsung hero in your life? Um, and maybe there's a fragment of a, a line that makes you think, okay, I could use that as a jumping board. So it's essentially, don't, don't be afraid of, of writer's block, just read with an eye towards writing. So that would be my advice. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, Charlotte. Um, I've got another question here, um, and this is from Amber Long, who asks, poetry has actively changed your students' lives and helped you engage with young people in a way that most teachers aren't able to do. What has poetry done for you personally? Thanks, Amber Long, who's in Columbus, Ohio, home of the Buckeyes, a graduate of Ohio State and Oak Park River Forest High School. Um, 
and someone who Hanif Abdur Rakib has, has mentored while in Columbus and been instrumental. Um, so the question was, <laughs> I just forgot the question. What does poetry do for me? Um, so when, I, when I'm going through stuff, I tend to journal. Uh, I don't tend to write poetry. I tend to write poetry when I'm in a workshop with Avan Jordan, who's working with my students, or AJ Matika, or Tim Siebels, or Franny Choi, or whoever is working with our students. That's when I will write. Um, but I'd say what poetry's done for me is it's gave me these friendships of the people in front of you. That's the biggest thing it's done for me. I'm part of Malika's Poetry Kitchen, and these fantastic friends who I've spent time with in England and Trinidad in Chicago, um, they wouldn't be there if not for poetry. So that, that's the biggest gain I've gotten personally from writing poetry is being a part of that lineage of Malika's Poetry Kitchen. Thank you very much. And I think we've probably got time for one more question. So I'm going to um, just pick one from um, our live chat here um, from Lisa New who asks, what poem or poet are you learning from right now? Wow, Lisa New, who does the PBS Poetry in America, I might have botched that title, show that's phenomenal. Uh, I really appreciate you being here, Lisa. Um, so uh, the four poets that are up there, um, some of the aforementioned po poets I've named, uh, Eve Ewing, Jose Oliveras, Jamila Woods, Nate Marshall, um, Chen Chen, I read recently. Um, Teresa Lola's book is phenomenal with Nine Arches. Um, I look forward to reading Rachel Long's, getting stuff out of there. Uh, Amy Nazuka Matatil, who we just did something with our students. Uh, Tim Siebel's poems about his parents and, and dementia were influential as I was writing my poems about my Uncle Al his Alzheimer's. Um, Sharon Olds is always a go-to person. Um, Raymond Antrobus, Keith Jarrett, Dean Atta, you know, I, I could go on and on, Lisa. So that, that'll be a separate conversation. I wanna introduce you to some poets you might not know. So thank you. Thank you, Peter, and thank you to everybody who's asked a question. That was a, a really lovely way to kind of round up our evening of poetry. Um, I will invite Peter then to read one final poem for us. Take it away, Peter Kahn. And thanks again for all of you who took the time to be here today, and especially um, Jacob, Malika, Nick, and Roger, and Jane, uh, and Angela Hicken in the background, Nine Arches. All right, so this is in memory of my Uncle Al, who passed away on April 3rd at age 85. It's called The Happy Alzheimer's Poem. Grandpa Hans fell and broke his hip. He had surgery and for two weeks, he was the happiest I ever saw him. He was grandpa, white stubble and all, but he was dancing with grandpa, Grandma Greta, though he hated dancing and grandma was dead. What are you doing, Grandpa? I just hit a home run. Where are you? In Germany, of course. Grandpa never played baseball and hadn't been to Germany since he fled in 1935. He hated everything German. Grandpa flirted with the nurses and spoke more in a day than in the previous six months. I heard about how he met Grandma on a donkey ride how he kicked the winning goal to defeat France in the World Cup, how he chopped off his hand at the butcher shop in Sao Paulo. I'm sure there was truth in the giddy telling, even if none of it was true. Memory of post-surgery funhouse mirror. When Aunt Sheila asked to see my poem about Uncle Al, and I tell her it's too sad, she tells me, can you find some not sad? I could tell you some things. He sings notes so loud it rattles our old house and plays the harmonica like every hole is his friend. He loves hearing the gurgle of water fountains and whistles back at the birds. With the right song, he swings his hip like he's a swaying tree. How are you doing, Uncle Al? Well, yes, I am. 
What's your favorite ice cream? Mmm, good. People ask, why all the sad poems? Given all the sad things to metaphor over, where's the time for happy? But maybe Aunt Sheila got it right. There's got to be notes of happy floating on the hip of sad. And when I tell my students they need to look at the world from odd angles, maybe this is it. Grandpa waltzing with grandma in his hospital bed to a song only he hears. Uncle Al chanting blessings through the holes of a harmonica. Thank you. Hello, Pete. Welcome, what an extraordinary reading. Thank you so much, Peter. A very moving end to this evening's readings. Um, we're going to go out on applause. So what I'm going to ask our guest readers to do in a moment is to applaud and to, to um, end the event. And then there'll be um, a little screen come up and that will be the end of everything um, for this evening's event. But just to say final thank yous, of course, to our wonderful guest readers, to Roger Robinson, to Jacob Sanmarose, to Malika Booker, to Nick Markoa, and to Peter Kahn himself for being such a wonderful encourager of others, for being such a wonderful poet and just being such an absolute delight to work with. We are so proud that Little Kings is here. Congratulations on this incredible book arriving. Thank you, Peter, for trusting us with the poems and to our wonderful audience thank you so much for joining us tonight um, it's been so lovely to see your comments throughout the evening thank you for engaging and asking such great questions and also to say thank you to apples and snakes who would have been our co-organizers at tate had that event gone ahead thank you for all of your support too and to malika's poetry kitchen also for their continual cheering of, of both peter and of so many poets um, good night take care everybody thank you for joining us stay well and we will see you all soon. Enjoy the poems. Um, thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.